Well, Esther Federkevich, it is an honor to have you on the podcast. You've been named the top literary agent in the world, at least as I was researching you. Um, but I thought an interesting place to start as I was preparing for this is you have a really, really unique upbringing. And uh, I believe you're one of seven children. And, and when I, I think I heard you say that your family, before there was Shark Tank, you guys had a version of Shark Tank in your family. Can you talk a little bit about your upbringing and what that looked like, Shark Tank in your family? Okay, so uh, my parents had seven kids in nine years. So we're pretty Woo. much a year apart, right? Uh, and they were entrepreneurs. So my dad came. They were, we were first generation Ukrainians born in the US. Um, but my dad, Ukrainian parents, came to Argentina. So my dad was born in Argentina. My mom was born in China from missionary family. Anyway, they, they end up. Uh, my dad drops out of eight, uh, eighth grade out of high, uh, middle school and um, comes to America on a visa to uh, make money and send it back to his family in Argentina. So that's what wow. these kids. Can you imagine our kids doing that now? Think about it. They're like, <laughs> hey, we need money. Will you go and work full time and send the money back to your parents? Well, so that's what they did. And my my dad started like in construction from the bottom. Hmm and grew to the one of the biggest builders in New Jersey and developers. And he literally taught himself. So hmm. as an entrepreneur, and he, he um, when, you, when you grow up poor and you grow up um, a missionary family, they say America money grows on trees, right? Everyone's like, huh. oh, money grows on trees. You can do, you can make whatever you want. You can do anything. And so we grew up with dreaming big and believing we could do anything and accomplish anything. So. As uh, young kids, my dad instilled entrepreneurship in all of us, starting businesses, no matter what they were. It could be from selling bubble gum to chicken eggs to whatever, right? <laughs> we, would, uh, we would start businesses. And the board, our board of advisors was our family. So when we had an idea, he taught us how to do a business plan. He was our financier. So he would finance our business plans if we got all the votes. But then wow. we would have to do all the work. So the tough part is we would have to do all the work, but he would give us the money. And the board was all of my siblings who would be like, that's the dumbest idea. We'd never do that. Or that's awesome, right? Yeah, let's do it. Or I want to get in with you on this idea. How about we go 50-50? We would do deals all the time, give people what jobs they would do, what we would do. And that's how we grew up. It was literally our own, before Shark Tank, it was our, our own Ukrainian Shark Tank. And we... We literally started businesses and like fell in love with business from a young age. And when you say a young age, so I have four kids under seven, you know, things like this interest me greatly. You know, how young were you guys starting? Okay, so my oldest brother was 10. And so think of it like the youngest, youngest two weren't doing anything. But he had an idea. We lived in this big house. We lived on, my dad was a developer. So the house I grew up my whole life was on Esther Court. My name's Esther. So he named it after Come on. A whole life I lived on Esther Corp. So we, um, they have a, they, my brother was 10 and he had the idea to do a carnival in our backyard. And we set up high jumps. We brought out mattresses on the high jumps. We, a carnival games with my mom's dishes where you throw pennies in everything. And we, and he charged, got tickets from Walmart and um, people would buy tickets to play our really ghetto New Jersey home games. <laughs> And we went into our attic and found all of our old toys. And that's where the prize is that they would win if they hit something big. Uh, you'd have to ask my brother, Josh, but I think he was like at 10 years old, he was right racking in like five, 10 grand on our carnival wow. and everyone oh from the gosh. school came. And we were all his worker bees getting paid nothing, literally. <laughs> we all it. it was super fun, but we all worked the carnival. But they, like we would, any kind of crazy idea we would do. And you started, I don't know what age you were, but your first successful launch of that was selling bubble gum. Is that correct? No. Yeah, well, my first was I sold chicken eggs, right? So we had chickens. <laughs> we lived on a farm. So we had chickens and we would box up the eggs and go door to door. And since I was good at sales and talking and cute, my brothers would make me be the one that asked to buy the eggs. So, and they would be right around the corner, right? I would sell it, get the money, give them the eggs, and then give the money to my three older brothers. So it was kind of funny. It's like, I would be the face of their company, their chicken egg company. And we did that literally every Saturday. So that was uh, like some people did newspaper route. We did chicken egg route. Uh, so that was fun. But when I was 13, 
my dad was teaching us about uh, ROI, right? And markup on products. And he's like, you guys, you can't think, because we kept thinking of ideas like, let's make a t-shirt for five bucks and we'll sell it for 10 bucks, right? And he's like, that's not a big enough markup. So I thought of the idea of a gumball, which was one penny. It costs to buy a gumball and you sell it for 25 cents. And so that's the, think about any product you can think of now that has a 25 X. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. Right. When you like, I wish I could think of an idea like that now. Um, and so we started a gumball machine business and, uh, it just grew and grew and grew and grew and, uh, then I sold it to my brother and he scaled it and just grew it even bigger than what I could do at 13, 14 years old. That's incredible. And if I believe correctly, when I was researching you, all of your siblings have become entrepreneurs as a result of this, correct? We're all entrepreneurs. Everyone has their own companies or starting their own companies or like one of my brothers um, helped start Disney Plus, right? So he actually worked for a big company, started Disney Plus. Then he left and worked for another big company, but he has his own businesses too and his own patents and inventions. So even you look across the board of our whole family, we're, we're all entrepreneurs. We're, we still to this day do business ideas together. Yeah. Talk to me about that. I think you say, how often does your family meet and what does that look like you know, today? Okay. So as of today, now all nine of us kids are in our 40s. So all nine of us are in our 40s, which is kind of cool, right? And we've all lived, we say we lived some life, we've made some mistakes, we've had some failures. And we do five of the seven of us kids, plus my mom and dad, but we do this with just our kid, with just the seven siblings now. Sometimes we involve mom and dad, um, but it's mostly just the seven of us kids. And we, five of us are here in Austin of my seven siblings. And we meet once a month for breakfast or tacos at one of our offices. And we talk about business investments. We also have a um, group text thread of all of us. So it's not just getting together. We're like, hey, this business opportunity came. Do you want to invest? I'm mm -hmm. going in for 10 grand. Do you want to go in? I'm going in. I have a thousand to give. I have a hundred thousand to give. Whatever it is. And we all go in and invest in the same kind of companies if we like it. And sometimes I'll like an idea. My brothers or my sister will hate it. Sometimes I don't get anybody liking it, but then that it's interesting because I get their opinions. Every idea we get opinion of seven of us deciding what's good, what's wrong, what are we missing? So it's, it's kind of cool. Wow. Well, clearly it seems like your parents did a lot of things right. And obviously they gave you the spark to, to be entrepreneurs. Uh, but I'm curious too, you know, as a father of four, I, I know you're a mom as well. Uh, you know, I'm always interested in how I can raise great families. Is there anything else just life lessons, leadership, or anything that your parents taught you that you think uh, would be worth sharing? Okay. So it's a good, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I heard Warren Buffett say this, I was listening to him in an interview and I'm probably going to mess it up, but he said something like, I want to give my kids enough, right. Mm. But not too much that they don't have to work. Wow. And I think with our kids, what so many parents make the mistake, it doesn't even matter. We don't have to be as rich as a billionaire, right? But we give our kids too much. Mm. And where's the balance where, why would, don't take that drive away from your kids. Let them want that, like drive that spirit of entrepreneurship that they want to start something or build something and see the excitement. Because if you give them everything, they don't have to work for it. And I think yeah. one of the big values our parents taught all seven of us is work, right? And so like, and believe in yourself and dream. And even if our dreams are crazy out there, that's probably never going to happen. It's still that thing of hope and dream and building and trying. So I think with kids, um, we're always talking about business ideas. We don't do half of them because we find out they're bad ideas, right? They start off with a good idea. And then we're like, actually, this won't make any money. You know, it'll be a bad idea. But then we have the good ideas and, that's what's fun because the whole family gets to share in the wealth. Yeah. Do you, um, do you do anything specific with your kids? Like, do you do the same thing your parents did with you as far as them coming up with business ideas? Did you carry that tradition down or how? Um, okay, so my kids are the oldest cause I got married really young. So my kids, I uh, have a daughter who's a junior in college oh, wow. and a son who's a senior in high school. So I have a 20 year old and an 18 year old. And then the next is a 13 year old. So by the time they had kids, so there's a, there's a gap there, right? Yeah. But every time we get together, we're always talking about businesses and all of us are investing, even the little kids, the five-year-old, six-year-old, they're putting $150 of their own money into a startup that we're investing oh, in man. as adults. 
So they'll put 150 bucks or 100 bucks. They they literally will put their own money, their birthday money into startup investing. And we tell them, you might not get this back for seven to 10 years. And they're good mm. with it. Wow. Do when you, do you, when Bitcoin came around, all of us did, like, like I'm telling you, like, it, and all the kids did it. And so it's, it's fun. And they're not seeing a reward immediately. And what a cool lesson to teach mm. your kids that you're not investing right now for tomorrow to get the money back. You're investing and you're saying bye bye to it for a while. Do you do you pay your kids an allowance? Do you make them work for their money? I'm, I'm just curious. How did you guys handle that? Do not pay the kids an allowance. Um, I so <laughs> their lives are really full. So I have a son who's going to be a D1 athlete. So with school, they go to a classical Christian school. So with school work, and there's no time for a job, but he does work. Like he'll have jobs to do that he'll get paid, but it's. It's different because when they were younger, yes, they worked. But now as they're older with schoolwork and like different goals that they have, it's hard to get jobs. My daughter makes money babysitting for any of her extra needs, but like their their needs that they have on a like regular, like their food and their gas and their insurance we pay for right now. But when they graduate, it's done. Yeah. They're going to be on their own. Um, speaking of money, you know, I heard you say in another podcast and we'll get more into your career and what you're doing today that money's kind of always just followed you. It's not really been something that you've had to pursue, um, et cetera. But we live in a, a culture where everyone's chasing money. Everyone wants to be a multi-billionaire, you know, by 25. Um, what have you learned about money in your life and career? You know, what can money do for you and what can it do? Okay. So, you know, the Bible verse, you know, the love of money is the root of all things evil, right? And I think it's the love of money when people are working just to make money. Um, I'm a strong believer uh, where, you know, the proverb that says all hard work brings a profit. Mm. But mere talk, when people just talk about ideas, mere talk leaves, le leads to poverty. And I think what happens in our world is so many people talk about ideas or talk about starting a business or talk about how bad their, jo their job is or how bad their boss is, but they don't even put the hard work in. Hmm. The profit's going to come to you just by working hard. Hmm. And I think people forget about that. They think things are going to come easy or they think, oh, it's, this is just going to come in this world of influencers that get paid crazy money to do a post or this. Like, honestly, I, I'm still a big believer. It's hard work. And I know that sounds really boring and really old school, but um, I've worked really hard my whole life. And I just, no matter what that profit is, I don't do it for a certain amount of money. I do it because I know God's going to honor it and I'm going to, mm. I will turn a profit. Now, people who are lazy or people who just talk about things and then they wonder why they're like living paycheck to paycheck. You know, and I, I worked for Dave Ramsey for a while. You wonder why these people are living like that. It's because they don't have the mentality of get up and work hard and give like my motto every day is I wake up every day and I'm going to give God a hundred percent of my time, whatever that is. I love that. You mentioned you worked for Dave Ramsey. So, you know, grew up entrepreneurial, I'm sure had a thousand business ideas that you could have done, but something drew you to working for them. I'm just curious, you know, how did you get on staff there? And what drew you to working for a company versus doing your own thing initially? Okay, so I was, I'm not going to give you the names of these companies, but I worked for a huge, huge Christian company at 19 years old. I got married at 19, moved to wow. Nashville, worked for a huge company, and I was really naive. I'm like, they're Christians, they're going to be awesome, right? <laughs> and I did telemarketing sales where I was in a cubicle making phone calls every second selling curriculum and books and um they had a campaign going that if you could sell to a new new person, no, first time customer, they were going to pay 30% commission on whatever you sold. So I got, remember my motto of how I grew up to work hard, right? Like God honors hard work. So I, I would get up and be in the office at 7 a.m., cold calling, telemarketing, like literally call up to call. And I would leave at 7 p.m. So I could get the East Coast and the West Coast in. And here, a 19-year-old, I did a million dollars in five months. They owed me 300, a little over 300,000. And they said I couldn't make more than the president of the company. Wow. And then my sales manager boss said, you're 19. You don't need to make this much. And you have to also remember I'm 19 and I looked like I was 13, right? I was going to <laughs> so young. And so they were, they, and then I went to my pastor, was a pastor of a big mega church in Nashville. 
And I said, what do I do? Like, is there age discrimination? Cause I'm young, but I did everything they said. I worked harder than all the other telemarketers, which is like letting things slide and work, making a phone call, then going to get a snack and going to like a break room and talking to, I mean, I literally didn't talk to anyone. I focused, but I was like on a mission to get as many calls in. Cause I knew it was a numbers game. The more calls, the more sales. Right. Hmm. So, um, my pastor said, Esther, you can't sue this company. It's a huge company. We won't let you sue. It's not right to sue this company. God doesn't love that. So um, I want you to talk to my Sunday school teacher at that time was Dave Ramsey. Hmm. He was my Sunday school teacher. Right? So they brought Dave Ramsey into this private meeting. And Dave told me, come work for me. I'll never cap your commission. And he goes, I'm starting something called Financial Peace University. And I want to know what you did to sell that much. Come work for me and I'll never cap it. And he took, he kept his word, he never kept wow. his commission. Um, I had an amazing experience working for Dave. Um, and I never sued this company. And my Dave and this, uh, our pastor said, God will just bless you. Don't worry. What goes around comes around. God's going to bless mm. you. You'll be fine. And I would in that model that, yes, I was hurt. And yes, it kind of sucked. I'm like, wow, people can like really like not be true to their word. But what was cool about it was then I let it go. I didn't think about it anymore. I like moved on and now I'm selling the next thing, you know, working for the next company. Um, it's bit, it was really cool because I kind of see how God now looking back 25 years later, you'd be like, oh, God really, God was fine with it. You know, like I had a plan, yeah. a bigger plan. Um, but it was tough thinking that you're going to have $300,000 in commission and then not getting it. Whew. So you went to work for Ramsey and, you know, Dave's made such an impact on so many lives. Um, I'm sure you made a huge impact while you're there as well. I, I, anyone I know who's worked for Ramsey, I always just ask, you know, being under that leadership culture, are there one or two lessons that you learned from your time at Ramsey that are worth sharing? Um, well, Dave's driven. He honors hard work, right? He's like, he teaches you how to do your own P&Ls. And um, the biggest thing, which I didn't know, because I didn't know I was going to start another big company like my agency four years later after I started working for Dave, but he taught me how to live, to start a company debt-free with no debt. Hmm. Taught me myself how to get out of debt. Um, that's one thing that our parents never taught us. They never hmm. taught us about debt. They taught us about how to make money. They taught us about how to dream big. They taught us how to be entrepreneurs. They never taught us about debt. And so that's the biggest like thing I learned from Dave. And I will always like, I don't, when people, when COVID hit or the recession in 2008 hit, I was debt free. It was unbelievable. So I wow. can make it through these times where other businesses or other literary agencies or entertainment agencies were closing their door. Um, I was able to be fine. And I really do owe that to Dave Ramsey. Hmm. That's such a cool story. Um, I'll come back to Dave and the transition to your new agency. Um, but I do want to ask you, you've been in your career, got to spend time with, you know, some of the most influential people on the planet, Dave being one of them, Steve Furtick, Tim Tebow, you know, Tim McGraw, et cetera. And I heard you say on a podcast, which I love this. I'm a big believer in this. You said, if you gave me two or three weeks, I could get in touch with anyone on the planet and, and have a meeting with them. Um, I guess first I would just ask, is there anyone that intimidates you or, that you would like to get to that you haven't gone after yet? And then how do you, what is your actual process if you were going to start today to try to get a hold of someone that most people think you couldn't? Well, I'm a big believer that you can get to anybody. You can't quit, right? Remember, you have to keep going and you have to be smart about how you get to them. Um, but yeah, there's nobody that I think that's somebody I couldn't get to. Um, and you got to be aggressive about it. You got to work hard and you have to have a system about it. My system usually is I find out if there's any connections, anybody that I know, even if it's a six degrees of like this person knows this person that knows this person. Um, we have LinkedIn today. So there's a lot of ways through connections on LinkedIn. We have um, this, we have social media, which is so much easier. Like I can DM somebody that they don't know who I am and mention a couple names in the DM and I could be lucky that they DM me back. Wow. So we, I'll, I'll tell you one that I'm right now, I'm, I think I'm one degree away is, you know, I'm in Austin and want to meet with Elon Musk, read his biography, super impressed, had a couple of things. And I went down that trail and I think I'm one person away from meeting with him. So it's like, and people be like, that's so hard to get. Not really. Like I'm now talking to one of his best friends who's making the connection. And, but it took me eight different people wow. 
connecting me to eight other different people. And then you're testing that one, that one, that one, that one to get to them. So there's nobody you can't, if you really want it, but there's got to be a reason. I'm not trying to get to Elon Musk to just get to Elon Musk, right? <laughs> What's the reason? So that when he, there's a reason that he would say yes to meeting with me. And I think that's the kind of thing as you're looking at who do you want to meet with? What's, what's the reason for it? Um, I don't ever have a reason just because I'm a fan, right? Like, I don't want to go meet, I don't know, Justin Bieber because I'm a fan of Justin Bieber. It's like, it would be a reason for me to meet with Justin Bieber. So I, I'm saying as you think about those things is like, what's the reason and, and why do you really want to meet with them? And if it's a good reason, they'll probably want to meet with you too. So that's phenomenal. So you get the meeting. I'm curious, and I'm sure a ton of people try to get to you as well, just with your background and what you do. <clears throat> when you get a meeting with someone, how do you make the most out of it to make sure that you, you honor and respect their time, but also accomplish what you want to accomplish? You may only get 10, 15 minutes, maybe more. I'm just curious, how do you handle the meeting? Um, okay, so when I was younger, um, in high school, there was like there used to be these big it was cassette tapes back there. I'm really aging myself now that I don't really like telling this story. So we would listen to cassette tapes, right? There was no podcast. There was no internet. There was no social media. There was no cell phones, right? But we would like, there was these like convention conferences. And I went at 16 years old and heard this guy, Zig Ziglar. Have you ever heard? Of, have you ever? Oh, read oh huge fan. Yeah, of course. I was so inspired. I bought, I bought paid seven hundred dollars i remember exactly how much it was and bought his whole cassette series and i would listen to him <laughs> every single night and i think that's kind of what people are doing now with podcasts right we have so much but back then it was cassette tapes and it was this guy inspired me and he was amazing and um anyway he has this one thing that he says he's like um you can get everything in life you want right if you if you just help enough people hmm. get what they want do you remember that you get, oh, you get help, yeah. you get what they want. And that is, that is how you connect with people is you can get anything you want. You got to help people get what they want. So usually our calls is I'm helping someone get what they want and then figuring out the right time for me to ask for what, for what I want. Love it. Thank you for sharing that. Never really asking first what I want. Usually, you know, usually it's, it's me getting them what they want. Then they'll give me something. So I don't know if you want to share this on the podcast now because you haven't had the meeting yet, but Elon, like how would you, you know, I'm, I'm going into a meeting with Elon. How will I know what Elon wants so I can serve him prior to him, you know, whatever my objective is? Well, we are, me I'm meeting with Elon on a total separate company. We have an invention um, that we think Tesla's going to buy from us for um, about three, four billion dollars. And it's a uh, patent. <laughs> we patented it. We took some years to do it. He never thought of it. He's missing it in his cars. And um, it's me and my brother. And we feel like it's so huge. So my going to him is I've invented that's going to change his life and make him tons of money. And that's why he wants to meet with me. I'm solving a problem for him. That's why he wants to meet with me. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm fired up. And I, yeah, it sounds like you'll get the meeting. I can't, I can't wait to see. Because I don't want anyone to steal it, but it's a really, I'll tell you later, but it's a really good invention. I look forward to it changing the world. So kudos to you and your brother. That's awesome. Um, I want to dive in. I'm sure everyone wants to hear about the publishing world, but before we got, dive into that, just briefly, you're at Ramsey and at some point you decided to jump out on your own and start the Fed agency, which is your, your agency that you do now. Can you talk about that transition and the launch and what that was like? Yeah. So I was doing, um, for Dave, we were, we started self-publishing before pe people were self-publishing. So I have a love for books. I love for story. We were doing all financial type of products. And I got, I was 25. I was pregnant with my daughter and I said, I don't want to just do financial books anymore. And we did this book called total money makeover which, and we did a huge campaign. It was so fun. It was, and learning from the best like Dave was really great for me because then when I had to go and start my agency and find clients, like I saw how it's done on the highest level to know that that is, that is a possibility for my authors at some point in their life, you know, even if they're first time, you know, and I'm starting as a young agent. And so I gave birth to my daughter in August of 2003, formed my company the next day and literally the next day. And uh, it was, there's no turning back from there. And then what has it been 20, this past, this past August was 20 years. 
And we've had over 100 New York Times bestsellers, represented over 2,000 books. And um, it's been really, it's been a fun ride. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about this just in general. Um, do you believe that everyone in the planet has a book in them and should publish a book before they die? Yes. <laughs> okay. So if that's true, um, if someone feels like they, they should publish it now, do I believe every book's a bestseller? No. But do I believe everybody sh has a story to tell and should publish a book and put it down in writing? 100%. Yeah. And I, I feel like I read some stat that, you know, 95% of people want to write a book before they die. Um, but I'm sure the statistic of how many people actually do is way lower than that. If people feel like they have a message in their heart to write, what should they do to start? Okay. So there's, you gotta be, be honest with yourself, right? When someone says, I'm going to sell a million copies and they have 10 friends on Facebook and Instagram, right? That I have no clue how they're going to sell a million copies because they haven't built any transactional audience. But there are books that you're supposed to just write and tell your story for your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, your great great grandkids to know about you. And I mean, I wish, don't you wish, Doug, that you could have your great 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 grandfather's journal or writing mm. of what he was going through, what was happening in the country at that time, anything like that would be amazing. So that's why I think everyone should write a book what they've been through, because as the generations happen and go past and past, books will stay around forever. And audio, like now we can put it on audio and you can listen to their voice um, to take the time and do it. But it's not everyone's not supposed to sell a million copies. It's very hard to sell a million copies. Um, I believe in the power of books. I don't look at a book sold as a book sold. I look at a uh, book sold as a priori answered. Come on. And um, I think if we can put great content out there and change a lot of lives and my authors write great books and I'm able to help them on the marketing and branding sky side and scaling that. Um, we can do a lot of good and reach a lot of people. I always say my favorite thing, it'll never change is when I get a letter in that your, my books, uh, my author's book is translated into a different language. Then I know we've arrived, right? When it's in all <laughs> languages. Because that's something we couldn't have done on our own. That was just God. Wow. Um, you talked about, you know, writing a book for your kids or your family, which is one thing. And then, you know, obviously some people do want to have huge platforms and write the million dollar or the million copy sellers. Um, but people can also write a book just for credibility, right? Can you talk to people who, you know, maybe they're not, their goal isn't to sell a million copies, but they can use a book to, to increase their business in other ways. Okay. So I had a, a financial planner come to me. Uh, she was taking investments of a million dollars or more, right? That was where her size of her business was. And we did a book for the purpose of growing her business and building credibility for her. She ended up moving 10,000 books, but the best part is her agency grew and now she's taking minimum of two and a half million, had seven more employees and has, you know, did 10 X in, in business. So a lot of times a, biz, a book is, first of all, it builds credibility for you. Do it right. Don't do it the cheap way. There's so many people online that sell you self-publishing that's a joke that it's not going it, to, it's just not going to help you. Call my office. I know the good other good people that do it. If we can't do it, we'll have other people, do, you know, that we trust that do it. Um, but publish right, you know, and then as you get it out, mm. um, use it to grow your business, use it to grow your following, use it to just grow your legacy. However you're looking at it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a book that, um, gets in Target or Walmart, you know, or on shelves where you're or in the airports, it would be nice. But to do that, you have to be one of the top 30 titles that everybody wants and is everyone's looking for. So we do a lot on Amazon. We're we're Amazon ninjas over here. And so we <laughs> really know how their algorithms work and how to move books and have people find books on Amazon. So that's a big strategy for us here. Yeah. So talking about different routes people can go so they can self publish on their own or find, you know, various people who will say they can do a good job. Um, I believe your agency also offers an agency assisted publishing yeah. and then traditional. Can you talk about if someone's processing, Hey, I have my book or I want to write a book and want to, you know, how do I even know what path I should go down? Okay. So traditional is all about platform. So you have to have a big enough platform that a traditional publisher will pay you to publish, to publish your book. Um, it used to be different back, you know, even five, 10 years ago before social media was what it was, you could get a book just because you were a great writer. Now, mm -hmm. even great writers need to have a platform and have to show a publisher how they're going to sell. Um, the problem with traditional publishing is it takes long. 
So right now I'm selling books that are coming out in fall of 2025. Wow. That's a long wait. And so what's happening, and we have a, another side called agent managed publishing, which is a hybrid model where the author owns 100% of their book and we service it and create a great book, but they own it. Um, we're having huge influencers with millions and millions and millions of followers not wanting to go traditional because mm. they want their book out in six months. They don't want to wait two years. They don't know what they're going to say in two years. They, they know what they want to say now. And so they rather own it all. Um, that's what a lot of people are doing now is they want to own all their own content so they can do e-courses and master classes and they can do movie deals or documentaries or, I mean, it just goes, the list goes on and on. So traditional is not for everyone and traditional is not like it used to be in traditional publishing where you needed them more because of how you buy books today and you can get your book on Amazon and look, if you, if 90% of all books are sold online, what are we talking about here? You know, and mm. that's including when you include audio sales in there because audio is all digital and audio is, it went up 347% in the last two years. Wow. So think about that when you're really looking at books, it's like you can do it yourself. The problem is you're going to have to have some money. You're going to have to invest it. It's going to be a business for you. Or you can wait and do it traditionally and help have a publisher help you scale it. But at the end of the day, it's up to you. You're still going to have to work that book. Yeah. On the, on the agent assisted, or I forget the word you used for it. Uh, like if people are looking to make that investment, what does that typically cost range wise for them to, to do that and get a book out in six months? It depends, fiction, nonfiction, children's book, but it could be anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000. Um, so it really depends on where they're at and also know if they're writing it themselves or do they have a ghostwriter? So when you have a ghostwriter, there's ghostwriters that are 10,000 and there's ghostwriters that are 10 million. Hmm. So like, like the guy who just wrote Steve Jobs and Elon Musk's book, you know, he's, he's probably the, one of the most successful ghostwriters. And I think he starts at 5 million. Ooh, wow. It kind of gives you an idea of like ghostwriting is a whole nother side. And then it's like, who's going to tell your story? And a pastor can't just take a book, a uh, sermon series and transcribe it and think it's going to be a good book. It doesn't work that way. So it's got to get a writer involved and make it right. Um, but that's where it's just like buying a car. I always say, you know, you buy a car, you want leather seats in it, right? going to cost you a little more. You want like the heated steering wheel is going to cost you more, right? You want, so all that is kind of in a book is the same way. You got to look at it and say like, what's your budget? And then what can you do? What's the best you can do for that budget? And we really help authors work in a budget and say, this is where I would spend it if that's what I have. Got it. Uh, and you talked about the importance of platform and I'm sure whether you, whatever route you go, platform is important. Can you just talk about like when you guys are looking for someone with quote unquote, a legit platform that it's like, Hey, this is someone we should consider. What, what kind of numbers are you looking for typically? Um, half a million on Instagram. A, uh, it could be the same on TikTok or Facebook, but we're looking that they showed. It really actually is even better if they showed that they sold this, their people something before. Mm, if they're, wow. They have a transactional audience. We talk about that. If they sold stuff, if they sold products, if they, they're getting them already buying from them, that actually is great for us for a book. A lot of these influencers can have videos that went viral and have 20 million views on a video, but they've never sold anything. That's very different than clicking and watching a funny video versus actually going to that person and buying. So we look at subscribers. We look at people that are invested in them. Um, of course, we have authors that have smaller platforms. Um, a lot of them have, they have shown that something's transactional in their line. So even if they don't have that many followers, they're selling something to their audience. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. So if someone's just starting from zero, which <laughs> it sounds like they'll have a long way to go, but where would you encourage people to spend their time uh, building their platform if they don't know where to start? Well, a book helps them. So a book's a great way. When you have a book out, um, they won't get a traditional deal. We'd have to publish it for them and use the book to grow their business or grow their brand and to start their brand. And a book's going to be really great for them. And if that means they, it causes them to have chances to go out and speak, that's awesome. That's what a book does for a lot of people. They get speaking opportunities they wouldn't get before. Um, I also would just think when you're looking at a book is a book is a part of a bigger thing you're trying to grow. When we do a book for a client, that's one thing. But a lot of times we have a movie or documentary or something, the e-course, something else that we're building. 
And that book is just a catalyst for us to do the other stuff that we want to do. Uh, I've also heard that that you love when authors have a vision of writing multiple books and seeing each book as a business. Uh, anything you want to say there that would be helpful for people aspiring to write? The reason I love that is we work for you, right? So we have to scale something. It's hard to scale one book. And so when an author has multiple books, Doug, we're able to scale it. You're giving us something to scale. When the first book does okay, the second book does better, we can sell more of the first book. And as our jobs as, as agents is we want to grow your business and help you grow and help you scale. So the more products you can give us, the more chances we have to scale. I want to dive into sales and marketing, which is on the other side of publishing. But any, anything else that I'm not asking that I should be when it comes to writing and or getting into publishing? No, you, you did a good job. Okay, great. Well, sales and marketing, I, I was really excited to dive into this because it sounds like you could sell uh, straight out of the womb. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll just leave this really, really open-ended. You know, What advice do you have for, for people, but specifically authors when it comes to selling and marketing their book? So I, I mean, you've heard me say this, Doug, before, but really think about a book like a business. So if you were starting a I don't know, a laundromat or cleaners or a Chick-fil-A, you'd want to do marketing to people know that it's there, right? You'd want, you have to spend money in marketing. And so many times authors spend everything in getting the book, book done and then it's time to market and they spend nothing. Hmm. And wow. then nobody gets to hear about it. And so I say, whatever you spend on the book is what you should be spending on marketing. Really realistically is you need to put money in marketing and you got to have a team around you. That's why a lot of these authors do launch teams and they have, you know, a bunch of people around them supporting them. They get, do they do Instagram lives and ask their influencer friends. Um, if you believe in the message, help get it out. And so marketing is really crucial to a book. And even at like, you can create great ads and, and great reels and great, you know, you, you can spend some mon money on that. Uh, it's just, how do you get your message out and don't just spend all this time doing a book and then it comes to market it and release it. And then you're, you're out of money and you can't grow it. Yeah. Where do you, you mentioned a lot of different things that people can do. Where do you see the greatest ROI as far as spend comes when it comes to marketing? Is it, is it social? Is it ads? Is it trying to get, uh, you know, media? Uh, it's all of the above, but it's social media, right? So <clears throat> everything, and it depends who your demographics are, right? So there's a demographic for, Facebook and, and there's one for Instagram and TikTok, right? And LinkedIn is a different demographic. So it really depends on what your number one de demographic is. And then that's where I would encourage them to spend the money. Okay. Um, and okay, if I gave you five to 15 hours a week, because uh, I'm guessing a lot of authors aren't full-time to, to market and sell your book, how would you spend that time? Um, I would do ads I would, and I would do a lot on Amazon. I would spend a lot on Amazon. Instagram, probably LinkedIn for you, um, Facebook, and we don't have to spend a ton, but we start with 500 a month in, in ad buys and see what, see what's turning. Right. The other side is I would ask you if you can speak, what places you can locally speak at and get out there and talk and then have books to sell. I would, um, and then I would do a lot on Amazon. And I would love to hear you specifically talk about selling. When you get in front of someone that you want to sell product to, like you're meeting with Elon, you know, what are you thinking and you know, how do you kind of, what's your process for, for getting the sale? Okay. So do you, do you, have you ever bought from an infomercial? Uh, I don't think so. Is Nothing. That... <laughs> you've never bought a product from an infomercial? Oh, so I, I'm a big beach body workout fan. I didn't get them from the workout, but, uh, from infomercials, but that would be the closest probably I've come. Yeah. I'm boring. Okay. So don't they do the shakes? Don't they have shakeology? Is yeah. Shakeology. Thing? Yeah. Yeah. Do you buy shakeology? Yeah. Okay. So a real, uh, Instagram post, any of that, that's, yes. that's the new infomercial, right? You're buying from clicking. Back in my days, we'd watch it on TV and QVC or Home Shopping Network. So I remember like any infomercial I watched, I would be sold. So one thing about me is I'm sold <laughs> super easy. Like I'm like an egg cracker that cracks an egg for you and with no mess, buy it, right? Uh, <laughs> the most probably inventions that never worked, I would love it because they did such a good job selling about ease of life or they were solving a problem. Um, like the ab roller, right? Or the, the like... 
the George Foreman grill. Like think of the my pillow guy who's super nerdy, but I bought it because it was the world's comfiest pillow, right? And by the right. time you get it, you're like, it is comfy. This is a comfy pillow. So I I bought like I get sold really easily. So that also is why I think I can sell anything re- really easily. And so when you listen to enough people selling and you listen mm. to enough sales pitches, you kind of know that you've got to solve what's the problem you're solving. So when you go in and talk to someone, what are you offering them? Is it ease of something? Is it is it wealth? Is it um, is it making their life, you know, their workflow of their work day easier? I mean, you just got to think, what's the problem, you know, that you're solving? Is it helping them cook meals for dinner for in 30 minutes or less? All of this stuff matters. And so when you know that and you go in to a meeting, you're, sell, you're solving a problem for them. Then their ears, you know, they... They listen. They're like, what, what do you have to say? Like, this is interesting. Hmm. So you have to know what problem you're solving and what they need solved. If you're solving a problem that they don't have, you're out the door. So you better wow. do your research and figure out what you're solving for them or what they need. And when you sell, you have to be confident. So I always say this, like, I walk in, I don't even know what I'm selling sometimes. I'm just super confident. And I'm like, this <laughs> is the best idea. And then they believe me that it's the best idea because if you're confident and you have good energy... They want your energy. But if you go in there and you are boring, what what are they going to, why do they want to have you in there? But if you show excitement and change your voice and get super excited and, and like do crazy stuff, they kind of like it because listen, they have enough boring people around them every day. <laughs> Several follow-up questions there. My first one is how does your ability to be sold so easily impact your marriage? Like what? <laughs> I'm just trying to, like, does your husband just see like a hundred boxes show up from Amazon every day? No, but he, there was a time that he, like when I was pregnant and you're like kind of crazy when you're pre- like eight months <laughs> pregnant. At two in the morning, I was like buying everything off the infomercial. So he like took away my debit card and was like, you are not buying anything anymore. Like this is done. But I was getting <laughs> But I right now we do have another company that we do inventions for, right? So it's interesting that I'm part of invention business because I love things in, inventions that people are coming up with or ideas that are new. That's why I love Shark Tank, right? I love mm. seeing new things that people are creating, um, and it's fun seeing if it works or if you could actually make it work. Um, but anyway, that's like a whole different side. But yes, I'm sold easily. But they, those people on them, they actually sell really well. Like the mm. OxyClean guy. He yeah. makes it like anything can be white and clean and amazing. That why wouldn't you try it? <laughs> right. But he's exciting. Is he boring? Would he sell it if he was like, buy OxyClean? It could make your thing. No, he's dynamic. So that's where I think a lot of people go in to sell something and they're not dynamic and they're not excited about what they're selling because they don't care about it. So find something you care about. And if you're writing a book, you should be selling something you really care about and believe in. And so make it exciting for the person. Yeah. You also mentioned confidence, walking in with confidence. Um, you clearly are very confident. I think I heard you say that like, you're not really intimidated. You don't get nervous around people. I'm just curious, like, is confidence something that you feel like you have as a result of being raised in a great home where your parents gave you, you know, the value, dignity, and worth that you needed to be confident? Is it some of the way you were naturally wired? Like, I feel so many people deal with insecurities and, and desire to have confidence. They just don't know how. Um, okay, Doug, how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have a sister and a stepbrother, so two, yeah. Okay, so when you grow up in a big family and there's seven of us a year apart, you go crazy for any kind of like airtime, right? Any kind of any parent's time to actually get your voice in for one second that they can hear you, right? But so I think we all grew up confident. We all we were also our own sports team. We all played sports, so we all were super competitive, but we all grew up confident. We were in a very confident home and very positive home, but we had to really work to get our voice heard. So now when we talk with someone, we don't have to work as hard when you have seven, you know, seven of us trying to scramble over each other to get our voice heard. So confidence, I think, and I, and I look across all of my siblings, everyone's confident. No one's scared to talk up in public. No one's scared to share their ideas. Um, We are also from Jersey. So Jersey, (laughs) but I will like confidence wasn't, you know, or speaking our ideas. And even if we were turned down or made fun of, or people laughed, it didn't matter. We were made fun of every day at home with seven kids all making fun of each other. 
So you kind of get, you let things roll off of you easier and you're not afraid to speak up and you're not afraid to be wrong either. You just go for it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I guess, well, anything else on sales and marketing? I just want to ask a leadership question and dive into the lightning round. No, that's good. All right. Um, I'm just curious overall, you know, you've been leading an organization that you started 20 years, 20 plus years ago now. Uh, any leadership lessons stick out that you were like, wow, when I made this shift in my leadership, everything changed for us? Um, okay. When I learned to delegate, everything changed mm. for me. It was really, delegation was hard for me because um, have you ever heard this saying, jack of all trades, master of none? Yep. So it was like, okay, I was a jack of all trades. I was good at everything. Like I learned how to do stuff um, because when, you, when you're green and you're learning and you're doing it all yourself, you just learn, right? You teach it. It's like, it's called street smarts, right? You're learning it. You're figuring it out. Um, but when you can bring someone in that actually is really good at this one thing that you don't, that you're learning or doing, like I'm doing accounting um, and I took accounting classes just to learn how to do accounting, but it wasn't my number one strength. And I hated it, but I did it because I had to do QuickBooks. I had to do the books. And as the business was growing, it was getting more and more complicated. And I was, and then I'm like, wow, when I hired a CPA, an accountant, and a bookkeeper here and a CFO, it was amazing how much relief came off of me so that I could focus doing sales and marketing what I want to do and what I was good at and let someone else do the financials part what they're really good at. And so delegation was a big thing, but really finding people in their own individual strengths. Um, a lot of people hire people that are like them. Like we like mm. people that are like us and that's great to have some of those around, but you really should hire people that have a skill that you don't have. And then that actually allows you to keep doing what you're good at and leading the way you need to lead and have these other people building other parts of your company. So that was a, a big learning lesson for me. So good. Uh, with a few minutes we have left, I want to dive into the lightning round. A bunch of fun questions I ask in every interview. And the first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Oh, um, I, I well, like I said, I have this motto that is work like it depends on you and pray like it depends on God. Hmm. Um, it's from Mark Batterson, wrote it in The Circle Maker, one of my favorite books. And so uh, that is my motto. And like, it's funny, I got that right when I started uh, like five years after starting my agency. And I really have made this my motto. It may be the same answer, but if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Yeah, I would do that. Work, work like it depends, <laughs> on you, like it depends on God. I like that. Yeah. I already know the answer to this, but what's one book that's made a huge impact on your life that you find yourself giving away most often or, you know, telling people to buy? So the circle maker, um, it's when I started really dreaming big for my company and mm. I was 29 years old and I believed that I could have the biggest faith-based li literary and entertainment agency in the world. And that was my dream and that's what I'm trying to build. And um, the circle maker, I started praying circles around everything, my every office, every employee, our conference table, every call I had. Wow. And um been pretty cool. So if you haven't read the circle maker, pick it up. And then he has a devotional called draw the circle. That's a 40 day prayer challenge that will change your life. Everybody needs to read that. You may have answered this, but I am curious. You've gotten to work with so many people, especially in the, the Christian side of things that people would love to spend time with. Are there any of other authors that you've worked with that have significantly impacted your life the way maybe Mark and the circle maker have? Oh, pretty much all my authors in some <laughs> way. I, I mean, right. seriously, all my authors in some way, I get to hear an amazing story, get to hear about their life, um, get to see God using them in big ways. Uh, everyone knows Tim Tebow's story. I mean, obviously it was pretty remarkable when he put John 3.16 under his eyes and over 90 you know, million people Googled John 3.16 in 24 hours. Um, pretty amazing to see like how God uses that. And we were able to do a book from that. Um, I mean, I have stories... I have a guy, a NBA player, Jonathan Isaac, who in the bubble stood when everyone was kneeling and uh, stood for Jesus. And it was unbelievable to see like tens of thousands of people get saved from him being that bold. And what people hmm. don't know about Jonathan Isaac is just a year ago from before that, he was in Florida State and struggled with anxiety, taking anti-anxiety medicine because he was so scared to talk up or speak up or raise his hand in class. Wow. And here's God telling him to stand um, in front of all these reporters, you know, for Jesus. So like that kind of stuff I hear all the time. Every author has amazing stories. And it's really just really I tell you've heard this, Doug, but 
We get thousands of letters in of suicides not committed, of people coming to Christ, of marriages saved, of fathers and sons reunited. And I tell my a business is growing. I mean, we just got an awesome one say of someone who's I encourage them to start a business. And then it's like now their business is $10 million. I'm like in two years. I'm like, can you teach me wow. what you just did? That's impressive. Right. And I think and I, I tell my authors and I tell my staff this, but it's all because of their books. Right. And wow. and I feel really honored and humbled to get be a part of getting their story out. Yeah, well, thank you for, for being obedient to the call and the plan God has for your life and the impact that it's making. And just thank you for being faithful. I'm sure there's times, well, I don't know if there were times you've wanted to throw in the towel, but I'm sure glad that you haven't stopped and you've continued to go. And I'm just so grateful for the impact you okay, have. Okay, I'll tell you this one thing. So, yeah. Like this. So, every, I believe too many people quit before their miracle, they quit before their success, they give up too easily. And in our culture today, too many people don't realize, like, just work hard and keep going. Because when you quit, you I mean, you, you could have been successful six months later or a year later. And I um, just because I'm a literary agent, C.S. Lewis, I was reading about him that a lot of people don't know this. But back then, OK, when C.S. Lewis was pitching Narnia, you would have to handwrite. There was no Internet. Hmm. There was no phone calls. Right. You would handwrite your letters, your submissions to HarperCollins or to. Penguin Random House, right? And you would say, here's my submission. Will you please take it? He went 600 rounds, hmm. 600 Ooh. rejections. And I always think about this because I'm like, if I was C.S. Lewis's agent, I would not quit him. I'm like, do you, do you th-? and I say to myself, do I think I would go 600 rounds with one of the best, you know, writers? And I don't know, 600 rounds working for free is a lot of work, right? A lot of rejections. But what if he stopped at 599? You know, wow. none of our kids would know Narnia. We wouldn't read The Great, Great Divorce. You wouldn't have, like, think about book after book after book of C.S. Lewis. So if if he quit, we would have lost, right? Uh, yeah. And I and I wonder if um, how many people have really lost in life because they just quit too early and they didn't stick it out. So I, if I could encourage anyone here is do the work and just don't quit. If you're feeling like you're going to give up, keep going. Um, cause you never know when your day is going to be so good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you get to spend time with a lot of great people. I'm just curious when you meet someone that you look up to, uh, and want to learn from, do you have a go-to question that you always ask? Oh, that's a, uh, no, I don't. I just, whatever I feel like wanting to ask. That. <laughs> okay. What's your greatest leadership pet peeve? Okay. My greatest <laughs> leadership pet peeve are, uh, you're going to, when people talk too much all day long and not work. It like drives me crazy. Like when they're just talking for hours and hours at the coffee thing or talking to this person, I'm like, get to work. Right. So I, I like, I don't mind you talking for a little bit, but my pet peeve is like all day long, just talking and fooling around and not working. It drives me crazy. I don't know if you have an actual bucket list or not. Um, but if you do, and even if you don't, what's something that you've done in your life that you think everyone should experience before they die? Oh, okay. I know how everyone answers these questions. Go skydiving, do this. Everyone needs to cold call someone. Ooh, that's a good Somebody one. Somebody that they want to talk to or interview or meet, cold call them. I cold call people every week that are the craziest cold calls ever, right? And I'll find their agent or fan, find their manager and I literally just call and introduce myself and they have no clue who I am. Wow. So if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to cold call and practice that because it's really good for yourself. It's really good. And it's kind of exciting when you do get the answer that you get a call with the person you've always wanted to talk to. It's good stuff. If you could go back and have coffee with Esther at any age and you would have actually listened to yourself, what age would you have coffee with yourself and what would you tell that version of Esther? Oh, um, I probably would have told just because I'm going through this with my son. He's a senior. I probably would have told my senior self to go play basketball in college, you know, and go mm. do it. Um, sometimes I look back and say, I wish I played sports in college, but I don't really care. Like I wouldn't have got to where I am today if I did that. So it's wow. just one part of like, ah, I would have told myself to play sports in college. Yeah. And last question, you've, you've talked about the impact that you've made through your work, but you know, one day at the end of your life, looking back, what do you want to be remembered for? Uh, encouraging, inspiring people to tell their stories. That's what I want to be known for. Anything else you want to leave leaders with today? Uh, don't quit. Go for it. <laughs> keep, keep on keeping on, right? Like, I, honestly, I just, I w if I could inspire everyone, just 
just believe in yourself and keep working and um, keep dreaming and keep creating and keep developing new ideas. Well, Esther, I've loved this. It was everything I thought it would be and more. Uh, just again, thank you for the impact you're making and everything you do. And hopefully we can do this again sometime. You're welcome. Thanks, Doug.